Aloha. I'm Richard Emery, your host today for Condo Insider. We talk about on this show association living in Hawaii. And as I've said many times before, uh, almost 40% of our population lives in some form of an association. And so understanding condos is probably important to some of you. And the best news yet is this is going to give you a break from all the drama of the presidential election. We can talk about condos, a mini form of democracy where condo board members get elected and serve their community. I would like to say without all the drama of the presidential election, certainly without the budget they have for the presidential election, but I can assure you that there's a lot of drama in being elected to a condo board in some of associations here in Hawaii. Every year, we probably have 30 to four removals of boards of directors because owners or some percentage of owners are unhappy with their condo board. So today, I decided I would review what I call the seven deadly sins by an elected condo board. Because if you look at all the legislation, excuse me, all the legal lawsuits on condo boards, there's some common characteristics would get people into being sued or strife or drama with the owners regarding a condo board. And it narrowed into what I call the seven deadly sins. And actually, uh, attorney uh, Richard Ekamoto came up with a, a similar presentation uh, uh, many years ago, and my sins are a little different than his sins, but um, I like the title anyway, so I'll give Richard Ekamoto credit for the title and uh, say maybe some of the content overlaps, but uh, probably some new content as well. So let's just talk about what I see are the basic mistakes that condo boards make once they're elected and and we'll go through them in, in, in simple terms. The number one and biggest mistake always forevermore is the first sin, which is know your authority. The fact that you've been elected and you have a mini form of government, meaning you have a condo board of an association that's really represented by the legal instruments called the declaration and the bylaws, although you have house rules and some other things, but for the practical sense, the bylaws of the association, you know, the declaration kind of defines what you own and what you owe, what an apartment is, what a common element is, what your obligation to pay maintenance fees are. But the bylaws, which is established by the declaration, gives the board written authority to do certain things. So they can't do whatever they want. They're limited in what they can do by their authority as defined in the bylaws of an association. And too many times boards think, well, we're elected, it's our association. We can do whatever we want. And no, that's not true. You can't do whatever you want. You're limited to what you can do by the, uh, the bylaws. Let me give you an example of a lawsuit I recently was engaged. Some of you may know I do a lot of expert witness work, but uh, let me give you the example that a master association, which had seven condo associations within it, had it was a 30 year old association. So it was well established their rules and, and how it worked. So what happened was in this association, the current board said, you know, we don't like the rule that says not less than 30 day rentals. They wanted to change it to not less than 180 day rentals. So they wanted to make it more difficult to rent short term, like 30 days and make it 180 days. Now understand this association had been operating for 30 years and people bought there saying, these are the rules of the association. And certainly if rules can be changed by a vote of the owners, but then you have issues of grandfathering because people who bought under the original understandings, like getting on a cruise ship and we're all going to Tahiti and we get into the, on our way and, and half 
or more of the people on the ship vote to go to San Francisco. Wouldn't be fair, would it? So the reality of it is you, you have this association, the one that changed the rules with regard to rentals. So they went out to the owners. They said, we'd like permission to change this to 180 days. Really didn't define grandfather or anything else, but let's keep it simple. And they want to change it to 180 days. And you know what? It failed. Not enough owners voted for it. So the board, in its infinite wisdom, said, you know, I think it's with our authority to tell our board members who were appointed by their condo to serve on the master board. It's in our authority to say, you were appointed by your condo. So everybody who did not vote, you get to vote for them. And we're gonna change the rules because you're gonna vote based on your personal preference for every condo owner who didn't vote in the original association master vote solicitation to change the rules. And so they did. And so all of a sudden now, the board is saying it's within their authority to have these condo board representatives vote for the board member or the owners within the condo who didn't vote at all. And so it passed. And so then they sent a notice to all the owners saying, you no longer can rent less than 180 days and we're gonna fine you $500 a day if you rent less than 180 days. Well, the story goes on that one of the owners who had lived there forever, and these are very expensive homes and condos, uh, said, you can't do that. And the board said, yes, we can. It's within our authority. And we, and we, we, we decided that that's how we're gonna vote. And in enforcement of that, they decided to go hire a enforcer. And they gave the enforcer the title of sheriff. And so in their wisdom, the board said, okay, enforcer, sheriff, we want you to go out and enforce these rules and go knock on doors of people staying there and, and ask to see their rental agreement. And you know what? The first person they decided to do it to was the owner who objected and filed a lawsuit against them saying, you can't do that. So anyway, the sheriff goes up, knocks on the door Nice young lady answers the door and he says, I'm the sheriff of this association and I want to see your rental agreement. She says, I don't have a rental agreement. He says, well, you, you suppose to have a rental agreement. How long are you staying here for? And she said, three weeks. And he said, oh, you can't stay here for three weeks. You have to leave. She says, I'm not leaving and shut the door. So meanwhile, the board then sent a demand letter to the owner and started fining him $500 a day. And he said, you can't do that. And, and uh, they then started foreclosure on his house. Of course, in that process, they neglected to ask probably I consider an important question. Who was the person staying in the house? What happened to be the owner's daughter who he is allowing to stay there for the purposes of um, her vacation? It was his family, he could let her stay. And so meanwhile, uh, this particular matter went to binding arbitration with an arbitration panel. And two things happened. Well, many things happened, but two important things. Number one, the arbitration panel said, you don't have the authority to vote for somebody else and voided the amendment that said uh, not less than 180 days. And the second thing they did was said, you violated your authority within the bylaws and the $350,000 that this owner spent to fight you on this amendment, you have to reimburse the owner that $350,000. That's an example, simply put, where the board says that we have the authority because we're the board of this association. We can do whatever we want. We can make whatever laws we want. We can do things whatever we want. No, that's not true you are granted specific authorities within the bylaws of what you can do and what you, it doesn't define what you can't do, but it does define affirmatively what you can do. And you've got to be conscious of that because over and over again, we see boards think that they can make rules, change things because they're the board when in fact they may not have been invested that authority. They may have to go to the owners for approval. 
some of them may be in violation of current federal or state laws, they have a process they have to go through when managing the association. And they don't have the simple ability to do whatever they want to do. And that goes on to claim after claim after claim from emotional support animals to putting in wood floors, to how you handle a plumbing leak, how do you handle a damage claim. These are all clearly defined not only in the statute, but in your governing documents. And you really don't have the authority to do that. What I hear oftentimes, by, and I just heard this last week, to be honest with you, on another condo, is that, well, I'm a board member now. I have a fiduciary duty. I, I have to do the things to protect the owners. And I have to do things to protect what I believe is the best for the association. And I have a fiduciary duty. And that's why I'm doing these things. Well, let me make sure you understand one thing about fiduciary duty. Because you're elected doesn't mean your fiduciary duty is to you, yourself and your agenda. Your duty as an elected director is to the association. So if the board majority votes on something, let's say four to one on to do something, paint the building blue, and they have the authority in the bylaws to paint the building blue, your fiduciary duty is to support the board. You're in breach of your fiduciary duty if you go out and you refuse to do what the board voted to do. You go out and you go to the owners. You certainly have a right to express your opinion. You don't agree on something. But if you interfere with the board's ability to enact a lawfully voted decision, you're actually in breach of your fiduciary duty. You have a duty to the association and you have a duty to the lawful decisions of the majority of the board of directors to support those lawful decisions to be enacted. So when people keep using this, I have a fiduciary duty, the fiduciary duty is to the association through its board of directors. And so long as it's a lawful decision, you have an obligation to support it, even if you're on the losing side. Doesn't mean you can't express yourself and be um, totally uh, 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 transparent about how you feel. But once the vote is taken and it's recorded, your duty is to support the decision of the majority of the board because the majority of the board has enacted a decision, but they feel is the best way for um, you to uh, uh, enact something. So I don't like to hear that fiduciary duty. I hear it all the time. I have a fiduciary duty to do this. Screw you, you don't have a fiduciary duty to do that. You have a, your duty is to the association and to the lawful decisions of the board. So the fact that you have a personal agenda you don't agree is totally irrelevant to everything. And that's interesting because we're about halfway through the program and we're on sin number one. But the good news is sin number two through seven. Seven go much faster than this one. This is the, the one I want to spend the most time on. So on that note, we're going to take a one minute break and hustle through sins number two through seven. And, and I can guarantee you one of them is not drinking red wine at a board meeting. I think maybe drinking red wine is a good thing in a board meeting. But either way, we'll be right back and talk about sins two through seven in one minute. Aloha. Well, I'm back and I'm sure you've had a chance to contemplate everything I said in sin number one, but it's basically you know what your authority is, you can't exceed it. And number two, your fiduciary duty is to the association if you're on the board, not to your own individual agenda or to the owners of the whole. Your job is to enact the decisions that are lawfully made by the board. 
So let's kind of hustle our way through sins two through seven. So um, being an old timer here in the industry and being an expert, I could go on and on with case examples of every one of these things that have resulted in a problem for an association. Two, number two, when you're trying to make complex decisions, seek professional advice. Ask your lawyer, ask your architect, ask your engineer. Don't try to guess it yourself. You will be more in jeopardy if you have made decisions as a board and you don't have professional advice to back it up. So if you think this is the proper fix for the building or the proper engineering, or you can think that you can, let, let's just use some EC500 to fix the cracks, which is Sugu, by the way, you, you need to, when you look at the association and then avoid risk for yourself, is to use professional advice. And yeah, it's a cost to it for the lawyer or the architect or the engineer, but you're much better off relying your decision based on experts than trying to just make it up yourself because you want to save a buck and not spend it on professional fees. You know, and uh, sometimes you may get information that doesn't make sense to you from a professional. Well, get a second professional opinion. You know, I just recently was in a condo that the professional said, we need to fix these 400 square foot decks and it's $170,000 a deck. Well, we went to another expert and they said, no, we can do it for $10,000 a deck. Here's the reasons why. You don't need to spend that much money. But the key is the board made a decision based on professional advice. So they have prevented any risk for themselves by relying on a expert, not trying to say we know better than somebody else. The third decision is make a decision in the first place. I mean, if you have these decks that are leaking and the cracks are there and you can't decide how much to spend or what expert to use, you know, the deck's getting worse by the time when more water gets into the decks, the more problems you have. You can't continually to say, well, we can't make a decision until we get 100% of the board members to agree what the decision is going to be. You've got to, at some point in time, make a decision that democracy takes its place. And certainly you can vote no, and you can explain why you're voting no. But at the end of the day, at some point in time, you have to make a decision for the, for the association to be successful. I know associations that have had numerous irrigation leaks for years. And, you, and they spend lots of money repairing them during the years, but they don't want to get the major decisions. Well, how do we stop these leaks? What major expense do we have to kind of put this and nip it in the bud? So at some point, then you're going to make a decision. The fourth common sin is we can't raise the maintenance fees. Everybody says, I don't want to raise the maintenance fees. Well, first of all, I don't like the word maintenance fees. It's an operating expense. You got water, sewer, you got employee medical insurance, you got all sorts of expenses. But everybody goes into this and say, we can't raise the maintenance fees. Well, you know, this is called a zero sum budget. You collect enough money to pay your bills and save money for reserves. So if in fact during the year, HECO raises the electric rates, the board of water supply raises the water rates, HMSA raises the medical insurance rates for your employees, Meanwhile, your insurance goes up because of all the fires in California. And yes, they do affect insurance costs. Why do you think you can't raise maintenance fees? So what do you do? Well, let's just reduce the contributions to reserves. Well, let's pay now or pay me later. You got to put the money in reserves if you've done a reasonable reserve study. So you can't be afraid of having what I call inflationary increases of maintenance fees every year. It's bound to happen. And unless you have some safe, money saving grace that the roof costs you more than you needed in the, in the reserve study so you save some money or you're able to manage your property with one less maintenance guy, whatever it may be, unless you have some significant change in your operating or reserve cost, why would you not think maintenance fees can go up every year? They are gonna go up every year or for most places they're gonna go up every year and they should be at an inflationary rate. You know, of course we see with the new developer projects, they. They seem to go up at a much larger rate, and that's another day for another story on why that happens. But the reality is you can't go into a board. Most people will tell you, most management companies would say, the first thing you do when you do a budget for next year is you do all the cost and reserve study. Then you add that all up, and that tells you how much the maintenance fee should be. It shouldn't be, this is the maintenance fee, we can have a 3% increase. Let's make the numbers and plug them. Because what do you do if you don't plug it right? You're short money. And so what do you do? You don't fund your reserves and it ends up an assessment or a loan down the road. So you can't go into this thinking you're never going to raise maintenance fees 
or your duty is never to raise maintenance fees because it's just not going to happen that way. Another sin, fifth sin, is maintain the property. I've seen more litigation and arbitration where owners have filed a claim against the board that they're not maintaining the pool or the tennis courts or the landscape or the lawn because they don't want to spend the money or they don't have the money reserves. They just simply don't do anything. They don't maintain the property. And then when there was a lawsuit arbitration in a Kailua project where the arbitrator ruled that the board didn't maintain the property and forced the board to raise the maintenance fees and forced the board to allow the arbitrator to make sure that all the reserve components were fixed. And think of it this way, these mortgage companies, lenders, take as collateral this apartment that you've mortgaged and they want their property guaranteed and protected and, and the values maintained and not fixing the water sewer pipes or not fixing the crack in the pool or not repairing the air conditioning system is not a good thing. It doesn't protect your property values. And your duty is under your documents is to maintain the property. So not maintain the property. And you know, we're in a world that things are more expensive. So you have to just get get used to it the way you have to do these things to maintain your values and and, and you can't simply not raise maintenance fees. So next, which is going to be number six, is most boards fail at all this and they get all these owners upset because they fail to communicate with them properly and often. Most owners, the majority, if, you're, if you're waiting for 100% of the owners to agree with everything you're doing, forget it. Never going to happen. But if in fact you can regularly communicate to the owners the challenges you have with the budget, with the enforcement of the rules, and you go to the extent to not only communicate with them, but include them in board meetings where they're entitled to speak, to really present these pictures and let them be heard, you're gonna be much better off than if you don't put any energy into communicating with them. And with email today, you don't need fancy newsletters and things like that, but simply short, concise, regular email from the president or from the board. And, and, and regular information with regard to what's going on, what the challenges are, even before you've made a decision. The challenge may be, what are we gonna do with the broken air conditioning system? There's two theories. One replaced the cooling tower, one replaced the whole system. We're hiring an engineer to evaluate that and look for the most reasonable way to do it. Maybe spending a quarter million dollars to temporarily fix it, and you get only one year life out of it before you have to spend a million dollars to replace it. Maybe that's a good decision, bad decision, probably a bad decision spend a quarter million dollars to extend the life by one year. But all that's back to use an expert. But if you don't tell the owners what's going on and what you're thinking, my, my experience has been most owners understand uh, what, what the issues are and most owners are very capable of digesting, even though they may not like the message that they, they, we have to do something to protect our property and, and spend the money. You can't measure yourself by uh, the maintenance fees or um, and, and if you do that, you know, if the property go to heck in a basket, you know, then you've, then you've breached your fiduciary duty because the, the, I haven't seen any documents that doesn't say that your uh, authority is and includes the responsibility to maintain the property. So the last one, and this is where I see more at the legislature than people making all these accusations. The seven sin is avoid conflicts of interest or the perception of a conflict of interest. I hear at every legislative session, someone say, our board has a conflict of interest. Well, the state law is very clear. If you have a conflict of interest, you can't vote, you have to abstain. So it's gonna rely on the majority of the other directors without a conflict to vote. But they say they have a conflict of interest because they voted for themselves in the annual meeting. That's not a conflict of interest. You know, a conflict of interest is that they're gonna award you the roofing contract and you're a roofer and you're on the board then you should abstain from that conflict. Doesn't prevent the six non-conflict board members from voting and giving you the contract. It just means you can't vote. But all these people who are disgruntled seem to run out conflict of interest, conflict of interest. And it's not necessary to have the conflict, it's the perception of the conflict. So if you do everything in open, transparent board meetings, then in fact, and you don't vote when there is a conflict of interest, then in fact, you have uh, you've done what they should do. So a quick review, because we're down to three minutes, is number one, 
Sin one is know your authority. Sin two, seek professional advice in your decision making. Three, don't avoid making a decision. Make a decision and get things done. Four, forget the mindset you can't raise maintenance fees. You've got to make sure your costs are covered and you're funding the reserves as appropriate. Next, maintain the property. Don't let your property go to, go to crap because in effect, you have an obligation to maintain it. And it affects your property values. It affects the quiet enjoyment of you living there. Then communicate to owners often and intelligently. Don't wait to the last minute when you have an assessment. You want to be able to tell them, uh, we're, these are the challenges we're facing. And it's probable or it's possible that we may have to increase fees or, or do a special assessment. I can guarantee you this, that'll get you people at a meeting if you tell them we're thinking of having a special assessment. So if you want attendance at a meeting, uh, what better way is there to, uh, to do that than to tell them the truth? I mean, there's nothing wrong with transparency or the truth. And then finally is avoid perceptions of a conflict of interest. They, they think that somehow, because you know, at the end of the day, the board has to pay the same maintenance fees and the same assessment as everybody else. So avoid their parents and the perception of a conflict of interest. And from my experience, those are the seven deadly sins of a board of directors. Again, pointing out to sin number one, know your authority because you don't have the ability to do whatever you want. And I probably could write another bunch of sins about don't retaliate against owners and don't do this and don't do that. But uh, we're down to a few seconds left on the show. So I hope you were able to learn something about the seven deadly sins. And if you're on the board or you're an owner, you've learned something to help make your association a better place. We thank you for watching Condo Insider and wanting to learn more about condo living. And we will have another show next week, Thursday at three o'clock. And aloha.